Welcome to Surviving the Survivor. It's not a podcast. It's a phenomenon. Here are your hosts, former Fox News political correspondent Joel Waldman and his mom, Carmela, a licensed marriage therapist and Holocaust survivor. So we are back, Harm. Uh, I'm not even sure if this is episode 16 or 17. I've had so much fun, I'm actually losing track. Do you know the number? Of course I don't. You don't. So I'm going to get straight to the point. I picked you up today, as I always do on Wednesdays for podcast day. You couldn't figure out how to open the door to my car. You finally did. I let you in. You sat down and I said, Carm, how are you doing? And what was your response? And if you don't tell the audience the exact- All my life, I don't remember. Your response was, fuck you. Yes, The first it was. two words it out was. of your mouth. It was. Why? Because you Is that annoyed- normal? That's another thing. Like, I would never think about this if it wasn't for the podcast because I'm so conditioned and so used to it. It's not normal for a 51-year-old man to pick up his mother. She comes in the car and he says, how are you? And she goes, fuck Focus you. Focus on the guest. I have a perfect reason, and it's not important right now, but trust me. Now, before it, we— It's related to texts that you wrote to be, me before. Before we get to the, to the guest, a great guest, I got my radiology, my MRI results. Oh, Number my one, God. Complex tear of the medial meniscal body involving the apex inferior Joel, articular this, surface. I'm not doing—if you don't—don't don't do this. What are you and my sister, who's a doctor, going to tell me? Now that I have this. That you have a proof that you are not no, no, a hypochondriac. No, no, you didn't tell me to take Tylenol or something and it'll feel better. That's, I already told my, right now my knee's throbbing. You want to know something? He's going to switch it off he and told, leave. He told you me, should. He told me. Teach him a lesson. The doctor told me if I don't improve in two weeks, I need to get it scoped. What are your thoughts? The same as in the car. We'll be right back with the main schmooze. Do you want to help my son? His company, Content Partners Media, specializes in brand video and content creation for innovative companies and others. Please go to www.contentpartnersmedia.com and hire him. I repeat, please go to www. ContentPartnersMedia.com. Welcome back to Surviving the Survivor. It's time now for the main schmooze. And we are back for the main schmooze, and it is a good one today. Carmela, as we went into break, you denied saying the F you to me, and you're full of it. And you even laughed because you know you said it. So just admit that you, that, those are the never, first two. I never said it. <laughs> I have I've it on never tape. said it. I have it on tape. I'm gonna, I, I said, I I'm said it in the shot, but I didn't use that term. I'm too refined for that. Remember? Your response was, fuck you. Yes, the first it was. two words it out was. of your mouth. It was. So listen, our guest today is a very interesting young man. He uh, is a documentary filmmaker and a Twitter celebrity. He is Jeremy Newberger. Jeremy, how are you? Fuck you. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. That that was good. Starting well. That was good. (laughs) It's just mimicking I'm my great. Mother. It's good to see both of you. <laughs> good hello, to see hello. <laughs> what an, it's the best to open to our show so far. Okay. <laughs> Let me tell the audience as my throat barely okay, holds stop on. Stop being a hypochondriac. Jeremy like, Newberger is CEO at Ironbound Films, headquartered in an old inn on the Hudson River opposite the West Point Military Academy. Are you there right now? Because we're staying at your window. No, COVID has uh, got me in Yorktown Heights where I live. Oh, nice. So Ironbound Films creates documentaries do- documentaries for theater, television, museums, and the web. Jeremy's recent documentary, which I watched, called Heading Home, The Tale of Team Israel, won eight film festival awards described by Rotten Tomatoes as one of the 35 best baseball movies of all time. I actually have a Team Israel baseball hat, which I got inspired to buy thanks to Jeremy's movie. Jeremy's previous doc, The Anthropologist, examined climate change from the perspective of an American teenager. Jeremy also directed 
Evocator, the Morton Downey Jr. movie, which I also watched and loved because I remember Morton Downey Jr. well. Uh, this air, this first premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival. It hit movie theaters. Remember those guys, movie theaters, um, courtesy of Magnolia Pictures, and it aired on CNN. Carmela, you said you had no idea who Morton Downey Jr. was, and then you corrected yourself to say you did. Because I, when I looked up on uh, on Google and I saw just one uh, scene, I knew exactly who he was. What do you think of my sunglasses? I think they're not cool. You are childish. He's also made films about social entrepreneurs and linguists, and that is not all. Jeremy has also become somewhat of a Twitter celebrity. His political satire is regular, regularly featured in Esquire, Salon, and Newsweek's Funniest Tweets columns. Also, BuzzFeed, College Humor, Cosmopolitan, New York Observer, and The Washington Post also all feature Jeremy's work. And as he points out, they don't pay him a dime for it, so F them. And even though I'm pissed, he has 90,000 more Twitter followers than me and a much stronger beard game. We reluctantly, reluctantly welcome Jeremy to Surviving the Survivor. Jeremy, that uh, bio was longer than the president of the former president of NBC News. Yeah, I remember that guy, Steve Kappas. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's a nobody, guy, right? Yeah. I mean, who's that guy, really? He's not he's not Brian Gumble. He's not Al Roker. Who cares? He's not Matt Lauer. Producer. He's not Matt Lauer. <laughs> yeah. So listen, you're already working oh, on your thank God he's not Matt Lauer, I guess. <laughs> I have a button under my desk. Um <laughs> right. so you're already working, I guess, on your next movie titled Punk. Let's start with that. We like to plug things to our global audience here. What is punk all about? It's called Young Punks. Oh, okay. Spelled completely wrong. And it's about a punk band from Massachusetts called Color Killer. And they're all ages 8 to 12. <laughs> they headlined the Warp Tour in Massachusetts, which is a big punk show, Carmela. It's where all the punks go. Hold on, Carm. And do you know they, what punk music yes, is? Yes, I do. What is it? They like dressed funny and they have wild music like. Yeah. How, how do you how, how do you spell the title? I'm curious. Uh, Y-U-N-G-P-U-N-X. Like a oh. kid would sell, spell it out. Young punk. It's kind of like uh, School of Rock, Little Rascals, you know, meets uh, Rock and Roll High School. And it's these kids are just little, little crazies. And uh, they're. <laughs> Their parents are their <laughs> managers and their, you know, PR people. And, and you watch them schlepping amps and, you know, drum kits into shithole bars all over Massachusetts at one in the morning for these kids to gig. And then they have a, a crowd of people with facial rings and colored hair that are following them. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. I mean, these are like, like kids for, not from the same socioeconomic group of the punks. They are. I, these kids all happen to live across the street from each other on a street in kind of blue collar Marlboro, Massachusetts. OK, I get it. How did you I'm, in, I'm interested in generally, generally speaking, how you come on your documentary topics. But how did you come to, to this one in particular? So it, all of them are kind of snowflakes. They're all different stories, right? Uh -huh. uh, they each have a different origin story. This one, I think it was like an old Jewish sleepaway camp friend posted a link to some alternative punk or music magazine that had a feature about a local band in Massachusetts. And then we contacted the band and, you know, they had a little bit of trepidation. Who are these, uh, you know, random Weird people? Does, yeah film our kids. So we drove me, Dan and Seth, those are my two filmmaker partners. We drove up to Marlboro, Massachusetts. We went into the home with all sets of four parents and we had a bunch of beers and then, you know, <laughs> we got to know each other. And then they were like, all right, you can film our kids. It's as simple as that. Uh, but I'm glad we did. It's a shame. This film should have come out like two years ago, but COVID has kept it in the vault. Yeah. And, what, uh, what's going on with COVID? I mean, obviously the show stopped, right? They're not there's no punk shows during COVID. We, we filmed a bunch of music videos for them during quarantine. They were still playing, okay. but just distantly. Uh -huh. So we helped them create a bunch of music videos just to kind of help them, which we felt like everyone else did. It sucked, right? It okay. just killed everything. But yeah. they, they've been, you know, not gigging, but they've been playing. So they're, they're, they're you know, trying to keep it alive like everyone uh, during a difficult time. Did these guys say. have like a legit future in music? These like the future uh, Beastie Boys or what? That's like a question that like, you know, it's impossible to answer because, I mean, bands like 10 years older than them break up and like, you know, for stupid reasons. <laughs> so 
I, I hope that they make it. They're really nice, you know, kids. They're, they're super talented. I mean, the youngest kid in the band, Lincoln, uh, he was eight when we started filming. He's the lead guitarist and singer <laughs> and writes songs. And that kid is like a child prodigy. Uh, so, how, how do you know yeah. how to play lead guitar at eight? I don't get that. I, his dad says that he took him to, he used to play his old punk records uh -huh. and he used to bop around to them. And he picked up a guitar when he was very young and he's just really focused and, you know, like any uh, young maestro, he, he learned how to play the guitar. Wow. Joel is uh, always fascinated by talent. I, you have, know? I have no musical ability at all. To, I have very little ability in general, but musical ability, yeah. I have none. I'm just See, I noodle. Up. I noodle around on the guitar, but just for myself. Yeah. So when I'm in a setting where a real musician is like, hey, you play the guitar, I just say no. Yeah. Because it's too embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's move on to the movie that uh, our devotees would love to hear about with our global audience that is growing. Um, heading home. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about it. How, how did you get involved with this? This is a story of the national. Well, let him tell the story. Jeremy, the floor. <laughs> Jeremy, it's all yours. <laughs> First of all, I have to say, I'm extremely impressed that your mom is like, knows how to podcast. My mom doesn't know how to add an attachment to an email. So I don't feel worry, don't, don't let her fool you. My mother has no idea how to do that either. No, no, no. My luck in life is that I have a daughter-in-law who helps me out. Jer, I'm not doing this for fun. I'm doing this for uh, monetization eventually. Do you think we've got something here? You're like a real, sure. uh, yeah. Don't, yeah, I'm, why not? Yeah, like I like it. There's like no mother-son. I've got a Holocaust survivor. I'm yeah, exploiting the Holocaust. Yeah, I even went through the Holocaust for him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I exploit right. whatever I need to. He's paid her dues, so yeah. yes. Yeah. Listen, I, I think it's great what you're doing. I, I, I'm excited for both of you. I, I love it. I love <laughs> mother-son stuff. I'm a Jew. What, what could be bad about a mother-son? We'll, 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 uh, we'll get to your mother-son relationship after this. Don't but think you're going to escape that. Yeah, but tell, <laughs> tell us about uh, heading home. All right. So everything uh, about heading home started with Jewish sleepaway camp. Uh, I work so with the a, last one. <laughs> I work with a guy named Daniel Miller. The two of us went to uh, Sprout Lake in uh, Poughkeepsie, New York, for Young Judea, a Jewish, a Zionist youth movement. Uh, it was a, uh, it was really a, a camp where not cool kids could pretend they were cool for two months every year. It was fantastic. <laughs> so while we were there, we met a third guy named Jonathan Mayo, and Jonathan Mayo. He ended up working for Major League Baseball as the uh, prospect reporter. And Dan and I, we went on and became uh, filmmakers together at Ironbound Films with a third gentleman named Seth. He went to a much more liberal uh, Jewish sleepaway camp. We don't even talk about it. <laughs> By the way, it. that's it was, another doc on Jewish sleepaway camps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there, I've seen one already, but yes, <laughs> I'm infinitely uh, interested. But he went to one that was just too far left for my liking. Yeah. So. Me and Dan met Jonathan Mayo. We've been in touch since 1980, you know, six, as camp friends do. And at uh, some point, he started pitching us ideas for documentaries like everyone does. And his films, uh, his film ideas were, you know, about more baseball stuff, not Jewish stuff. But John has always had a fascination with who are the Jews in baseball. Uh, just in the same way that, you know, us Jews watch the Oscars and say, you know, whisper, he's the, Jew. The hairdresser was Jewish. Yeah, right. Yeah. Or as soon as someone wins an award, you see the, the, the letters in their name. You're like, ah, we won another one. So <laughs> he, he would follow the Jewish players and he would meet them when he was reporting on the prospects of Major League Baseball and became friendly with some of them. One in particular named Josh Zide. Uh, Josh Zide was a pitcher. He played for the Astros, I believe, and uh, a few other teams to boot. And the two of them got to talking about going on a birthright trip with other players, uh, other Jewish players. <laughs> so John called us and pitched us the idea. And we thought it had interest. You know, you don't see a lot of the, the Jewish players in baseball kind of on a trip to Israel could be interesting. So I went to spring training in 2015, I believe it was. I went to Arizona and Florida. Uh, you know, in baseball, all the players are in Arizona or Florida for the spring training months before the season starts. And we went on a roundup of Jewish players. I think we interviewed Josh Zido, I mentioned, uh, Jock Peterson from the Dodgers. He's Jewish. Uh, 
Jewish. Oh my his God. brother, uh, Tiger, I think his name is, went to Israel on a birthright Wait, trip. Jock Peterson is he Jewish. He probably um, has many yeah, ancestors um, who are not. Dude, I thought there was one Jewish, maybe one Jewish player. And it was. No, uh, there, there's quite a few. That's so it's crazy. Brad Ausmus, who's a, a, a manager of the Tigers, when I met up with him, he uh-huh. was Jewish. There was actually three Jews on the Tigers wow. Jock Side, Brad <laughs> Ausmus, and uh, uh, who's the other one? Oh, and. Um, Ian Kinsler, wow. uh, who's a, a, a world-class top ranked player, Ian Kinsler. And then we went to, um, I think it was the, um, I'm losing my mind a little bit on which, you know, parks we were at, but at the end of our, our shoot, we had interviewed Ike Davis and Nate Fryman and Sam Fold. These like really great, you know, utility Jewish players. I think Ike Davis was the biggest name of the batch. Mm-hmm. Uh, for those in New York, they know him from the New York What Met. is it, the term utility players They play mean? a particular position or fill, oh. fill a role, a specific okay. role. Okay. Sorry, okay. Mel, I'll keep the baseball jar. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, I'm all here to learn. So, so yeah, so then this, uh, this, this like kind of morphed into following, they, they, all became part of the Israel national team? What, what, no, no, no. One? They went on, first they went on this uh, birthright trip. No, they never went. So here's the, here's the unfortunate part of the story. I come back with this great footage. I put together a, a tape, a sizzle, uh-huh. you know, to try and sell the idea. And nobody wants the idea. They tell me, <laughs> oh, man. So I put it in the garbage. I didn't think about it. And then sure enough, Israel puts together a team for the world baseball classic, which Carmelo, that's like the world cup of baseball. It happens every four years. And Israel put together a team of a bunch of the guys that I interviewed and sure enough, they qualified at the Brooklyn qualifier. (laughs) So I get a phone call from, you know, John Mayo, who, you know, originally introduced me to this content. And he says, Hey, we're going to go to Israel. Do you want to come along? Uh, and we can actually make the documentary now. So I followed them on a trip to Israel. And, uh, I think it was the end of 2016. Uh, we went, uh, for about 10 days. Uh, and I filmed, you know, these guys, first time trip to Israel, some of them, you know, really not from a Jewish background. And, uh, it was just fascinating to watch their trans transformation and their, uh, their reaction to Israel. It was similar to, I mean, when I went as a teenager for a year, uh, with my youth movement, it was kind of like that, but with athletes instead of yutzes. Like me. Mm-hmm. So, so I filmed this trip to Israel and then I used that footage to make uh, raise money in a Kickstarter to go to Korea with the team for the world baseball class at Carmel. They do it in Korea and in Japan and in all these different countries that have teams. Wow. So, uh, yeah, so I, I went to the, the uh, World Baseball Classic in 2017, and thinking I would be home in a single, you know, match. Not thinking these guys <laughs> do anything. Yeah, and like then, guys. I think they were like watch- they were 200 to one like underdogs, I believe. They were 200 to one underdogs, right? And I, I think we kind of just walked into it. it. It became like the miracle story of the World Baseball Classic in 2017. I mean, how and awesome now- is that? Like you're there filming this and these guys are like on, on this winning streak, like against all odds, right? And you're there capturing it all. That's it, pretty it had awesome. A, it had emotional ups and downs. I think mm. Seth and I, who were there together for my, my team, uh, we became attached to the guys in Israel from, you know, as you would with like any group that you go on a trip with. So we were kind of rooting for them on a friend way. And then all of a sudden it was a, a, a world story and the stakes were so high. And we were just now stressing that we weren't prepared to do justice to this kind of big story. Uh, so we were freaking out a little bit, uh-huh. you know. You uh, went but, with you went with photographers and uh, you directed and that's what they did. Yeah, so no, I'm no, no. I, I had to get the picture of what was yeah, going. Yeah. So me, a big guy. I'm about almost six feet, and Seth who's about four foot, you know, nine. <laughs> look alike, so we're just like a you know we're like a, a Mad Max movie villain that's walking around. And we would hire local camera crews either in Japan or in Korea to help us, uh, and we would direct and, and shoot a little bit ourselves. So uh, we were a slim team covering this, uh, and we just lucked into this crazy good story. Uh, I, I can't put it any other way other than luck. What was uh, their reaction to uh, visiting Israel? Uh, so each one had kind of a different reaction or different experience, but overall, 
I think they were really uh, moved by the country and the sort of historical relevance to being a Jew. So these are guys that didn't grow up as uh, yeshiva bookers. Yeah. They didn't go to Hebrew school, most of them. They weren't bar mitzvahed, most of That's them. That's because they were at the batting cage like four yeah, hours a day. Camp all their yeah. lives. They were all cool. Yeah. Yeah, they were cool. <laughs> yeah. So th- the fact that now they were in this country that they had to represent on the world stage, it had this kind of, uh, you know, meaningful, mystical, uh, uh, what we call it? reaction, all of them. Uh, and if you follow the first half of my film where we track their trip to Israel, you'll see that someone like Ike Davis, who had zero, zero Jewish background, you know, his dad was a redneck, you know, he really nothing. He was like, hey, I think I could live here. You know, they were having like. <laughs> I like the shawarma. <laughs> Actually, one of the one of the most interesting sound bites to me was uh, I think you guys got like a MOS, a man on the street. That's TV news lingo, Carm. With uh, oh, thank you, darling. With um, a Palestinian who said something like, "I hope that one day my kids or grandkids will grow up to play baseball instead of throwing rocks at Israelis." Was it? Is that right? It was something like that. He was making a joke uh, yeah. about they would he'd love for there to be a Palestinian team uh-huh. and so they would be very good pitchers because they know how to throw stones. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what, Joel? A scene before that, we met Sammy, this Palestinian T-shirt uh, shop merchant in the Shuk, the Arab uh-huh. market in Jerusalem, mm-hmm. and it was amazing. It was like we found the the biggest baseball fan of all of the Palestinians. <laughs> That's interesting. Making fun of Josh Zide, the player. Did he know not- them? Did he know who they were? He didn't know who they were because remember, Josh Zide was not like a marquee name in baseball. Yeah. This was making fun of Josh Zide, saying he shouldn't be on the Astros. He should be on a, a winning team like the Yankees. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Astros won the World Series like the next year. <laughs> yeah. So he, he was not so right in that regard. But it was just really incredible that all of a sudden this Palestinian and this Jewish kid were really bonding over something like baseball and the walls around them were melting down and there was no hatred and there was no you and us. It was just, you know, how something good can unite people. And it's my favorite moment in the film. So that was kind of the subliminal message too. Yes. Yes. The, the, I mean, listen, there's no politics in this film. Uh, they're a, a pretty apolitical squad. They represent Israel, which comes with its own kind of baggage or politics, depending on where your political slant is. Yeah, and it, and it has Arab population and it has a Jewish population. So you yeah. you have to do the both. But, you know, sometimes you, you f- film something and then when you look at it uh, later, you realize that there was this whole other undercurrent going on. And I think... Karm is a uh, giant Zionist. We actually, I don't think you know this, Jeremy, but my parents made Aliyah when I was two. No, so I, we two did to not. Five. Uh-oh. We Hold did on. not. We never became Israeli citizens. Well, you moved to we Israel. Were, we were temporary. Uh, when I survived the Holocaust and I felt that the Jews' place is in Israel. So uh-huh. I said to my husband, who who is an American from the Bronx, uh, and we are now celebrating our 60th in a few weeks. Wow. So, uh, so I said to him, I'm going to marry you under one condition. I want to live in Israel. Uh, and we were both broke like church mice. Yeah. You know the expression? My dad said under one condition, if I can make money and he couldn't. No, 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 no. It's not that simple. You always <laughs> read and simplify my stories. Go for it. And huh? you elaborate at length at your stories. Just keep in mind we're on the clock. Go for it. So, no, the end of the story was that we we uh, took the two children, sold our house after a while when we put together a, a little savings and we went uh, went to Israel. And we went in 1971, and in 1973, the Yom Kippur War broke out, and my and we spent all our money on 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 an apartment, so we had no cash. And then the war broke out, the Yom Kippur War, and and nobody needed a psychiatrist. My husband is a psychiatrist. Nobody. It's a they very interesting. To worry about. They, they really had reality-based worries, so nobody went to a psychiatrist. 
And my husband grew up during the Great Depression, sort of the aftermath of the Great Depression. Right. And and he got horrified because the, that's his biggest uh, fear to to die, you know, homeless or something. It's my biggest fear, too. Now Joel inherited it. Now it's Joel's biggest fear. So anyway, so we came back, but we were only temporary residents. Fantastic. I lived there for one year of college and I've been there, you know, 30 times or so. Yeah. Uh, and I determined that my love for Israel is uh, historical and it is cultural, but it is not geographical. I did not want to live there. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I would I would live there because I tried it for three years. I went to an ulpan. I learned Hebrew. They have horrible cable uh, not, TV. I mean, Maybe that's improved. Uh, I mean, uh, and it's it's so far from perfect as we are from you now geographically. The biggest yeah. the biggest takeaway from all this, Jeremy, was uh, prior to you, we had David Camp on, who you can okay. Google. He is the author of Sunny Days, one of the best books of 2020, a definitive book on Sesame Street and the Why era did you of bring children's him, TV. Him up? Shout out awesome. to because we had uh, David Camp on, and I realized that because I lived. In Israel, from two to five, I had never watched Sesame Street in my entire <laughs> life. That's the biggest yeah, takeaway. Uh, Rahov Sum Sum knockoff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah Rahov Sum Sum. So, right on, right on. Pivoting away from uh, this is my favorite. Pivoting away from the uh, heading home movie in Israel, Morton Downey Jr. Yeah, he would probably have worn blue tinted sunglasses on TV if he was that cool, uh, which he was, but he didn't think about it. But what was that like? How did you how did you get him as a quote unquote get for a doc? Yeah. This was a this was interesting. We were out to lunch, Dan, Seth, and I, you know, uh, and we were you know driving like I think to uh, Beacon, New York, to get lunch. That's the closest lunch spot. And, you know, we usually have like a schmooze fest the whole ride. And it came up that the three of us all used to watch Morton Downey Jr. show in the late <laughs> 80s. This is during uh, junior high school age for me and, you know, maybe high school for you, Joel. Yeah. But uh, the show was like New Jersey raw Secaucus studio. He was a chain smoking, uh, loudmouth demagogue. And he used to encourage fist fights and scream at people in their face. It was like Jerry Springer, but it was more politically charged. It wasn't, you know, a schlocky uh, guests, at least at first. So all of us watched it and all of us knew people who went on the show. Uh, and by going on the show, not as a guest, but Mort would involve the audience at what they called the loud mouth, a podium that was in the audience that people would come up and in their, you know, Long Island, New Jersey accents would, you know, start screaming or trying to rip a new one into whoever he had on the stage, which was usually like a mixture of, you know, uh, journalists and then like heels, like wrestling. He would have like a heel on the stage who he knew people would rip. To you know, shred. Hold on. Do you know what a heel is? Carm doesn't know. No, I don't. I was going Speak to Speak up, you. Carm. Okay, a I don't. And wrestling is fake as opposed to my beloved MMA UFC. But yeah, in wrestling, they have um, like a bad guy on purpose. So, the you know, it's like the good guy versus the villain. That's the heel. Okay. Well, I want to uh, – can I interrupt here for a yeah, fun sec? Uh, I, I am aware that you and your two partners, the three of you, you have a certain effect on each other – that it's almost this synergy that creates something on a different level. And I, I kind of think that's terrific because it's like, you know, you keep each other going. You probably are like wild together. Yeah, we have a good time. We're, we, I mean, I think uh, the film <laughs> festival programmer at Sundance where we had our first film, she called us the Troika. Which Troika, is, uh, yeah, I know, that's right. For the three, you three know, horses, and, yeah. Yeah, so the, we kind of feed off each other. We've known each other since, again, Jewish sleepaway camp age. And uh, we all kind of bring a different uh, special spice to the equation. And uh, I guess uh, I'm sort of uh, in the field kind of getting people to talk and schmoozing and kind of being uh, creative, you know, while we're filming. And Seth is an incredible camera guy who has... Uh, an ability to make people say or do anything like they'll, they just trust him. He's the little guy. And then Dan is like a brilliant, uh, scalpel in terms of weaving a story as it's happening and thinking big picture, even when we're, you know, thinking small scene. So the three of us kind of 
come together in a great way. We've made about eight films together. So when we have an idea in the car on the way to lunch, we have to take it seriously. <laughs> how often do you have, how often do you have lunch? <laughs> often. Well, used to eat for two hours a day. Uh, <laughs> one of the uh, distributors uh, for the Heading Home movie, he was, he would always be trying to get us, you know, his morning California time and we'd be out to lunch. He's get so angry with us. <laughs> so, so, so Morton, back to Morton for a minute. He was kind of uh Roger Ailes esque ahead of the time. His uh, his um, kind of signature phrase was "pablum puking liberal," and then he would yeah. scream out "zip it." But it's kind of interesting because he was tapping into kind of this right wing zealotry. Is that a word? But uh, is whatever. Was this during uh, during uh, what? This the was in the Reagan, 80s. Reagan during this Reagan. Eighty eight, eighty nine. It was like the end of Reagan, beginning Bush. of Bush. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, Listen, I watched the show as a middle school kid. I was not a right wing, you know, political Fanatic, person. Yeah. I, I'm still not. But there was something that pulled you into his act. Uh, I think he would have people like Alan Dershowitz on defending Israel against, you know, whoever the villains he would put next to him. Or he would have, you know, uh, Brent Bozell from the, you know, the, the right wing guy, you know, defending uh, pro-life. <laughs> and, and, and like if he didn't agree with some piece of what you said, whether he was on your side or not, he would attack you. So it was more of like a, a screaming show that was really enticing to middle yeah, school. Yeah, that gave a new meaning to the word attack on television. Karma, yeah. I don't want to sound self-centered here, but the, you hear oh, this? Oh, this starts very badly. You hear, when he you, doesn't you hear want... this? Like, we need a little more confrontation. You tell me to fuck off, and then we come on air. I and never you're all said prissy. that. It's not nice you, that you are you bringing said, the whole world God, will now. We're think, talking about Israel. God knows what you said. God knows, God knows and God said. forgives. God forgives. I'm just saying, be yourself a little bit more, and we'll get our. He's very global. worried. He's very worried that I'm very subdued. I'm, I'm, making, I'm impressed by him. I think you pulled something out. I mean. Take the country, 330 million people, okay? Here are the three guys, you three guys, and yeah. you do a dozen uh, uh, documentaries that are uh, totally impress the hell out of them documentaries. Jeremy, let yeah. me ask you a quick So I'm impressed. I mean, I'm yeah. silent because I'm impressed. It's Jer nice to hear that. I think uh, just this week with them saying that my baseball movie is one of the best baseball movies of all time. That's like the first time anyone's noticed us. So <laughs> it's actually maybe the next 30 years will be easier to make films. Yeah. Jeremy, back to me for a moment. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you ever have a, a mo so this happened, you know, I worked for, you know, this, I worked in broadcast news for 20 something years. By the end I was doing okay. Um, and then it was just time to get out. Um, but do you ever have these moments where you're like, man, I should have like been like an investment banker and like really focused on like making money instead of kind of pursuing labors of love and passion? I'm sure you're doing okay, well, my but- wife, My wife does. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> but I still live in La La Land where if it feels good, do it, you know? Uh, but listen, if I wanted to be a wealthy man, I wouldn't be making documentaries. That's for, for, for sure. Yeah, but you love it. Who, who was the one who said it's intersecting of- uh, what you love and what you are good at. You said that. I said that in another interview. Would yeah. you guys watch the tape? <laughs> we do our homework, man. I, I, I tell you, I have to read this. One second. I think so. I, so Ironbound, your company, does issues of globalization, uh, intercultural and mass communication, technology, terrorism, poverty, capitalism. Wow, you know Jeremy, that covers you just got a free like the, ad copy. Free it covers read. the world and the surrounding areas, you know. We're, we're, we're no, you are free. It's like a certain freedom. Yeah. Uh, listen, I think the idea just has to sort of be something that we wouldn't mind marrying for five years because that's yeah. how long it takes yeah, yeah, to develop yeah. something. So, it's something that keeps our interest for long enough, then we make a film. If it's uh, too fly by night, then it won't work for us. And we're not uh, the Michael Moores and the Errol Morrises and the Ken Burns. We're not names that are household names. So we have to still kind of scrappily fight it out to get our films, you know, where they end up. Uh, but but, do, but do you get financing easily or it's a struggle? 
I think, I mean, compared to independents who haven't had a film at Sundance, it's easier. Uh, we've opened doors by being, you know, nominated for Emmys and being on PBS and CNN. And, you know, every film makes it a little easier for the next one, uh, I'd say. But, you know, in the beginning, it wasn't so easy. Uh, and this was my first film. The, uh, it was called The Linguists. And it went to Sundance. So I think that that was just like an incredible lucky break that helped make it easier for us to make films together. Yes, Carmela. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I read about the linguists, about these dying languages. Yeah. And you hooked up with these two people. Mm -hmm. And... And not in a sexual way, like hooked right. up no, with them. No, it was them. no hookup. It was not a Tinder account. <laughs> no, it was a connection. Connection. Sorry, yeah. wrong term. To make the short story long, how, uh, how did you get get to that? Uh, how did you stumble into that or fall into that or walk into that? So my partners, Dan and Seth, started the film before I joined, and it was called Vanishing Voices. And it was about uh, different communities around the world where language were dying. But one of the uh, stories they were following were two linguists named David and Greg, who Noam Chomsky had suggested they talk with. Uh, he's also a, a big name. In, I know, in I know Noam Chomsky. So, uh, David and Greg went with Seth to Siberia on a first trip. And when they came back with all this footage from around the world, I joined the company and I said to Dan and Seth that David and Greg, to me, were the movie. And they agreed after, you know, a little bit of fighting. <laughs> and then we went off with David and Greg to film their journeys into these communities around the world where languages are dying. And it became this kind of Indiana Jones road trip buddy film that Sundance liked and PBS put on and was nominated for an Emmy. Uh, and it's my wife's favorite of my films. It's called The Linguists. The linguist. Well, that but at that out. point, you were the the president of CEO of your company, right? Of I Iron joined a three person company uh, and brought uh, corporate clients with me. So, in in an effort to keep the corporate clients in the sort of mystique that I was at this giant firm, we said, "Okay, I'll be the CEO, <laughs> you be the president, you be the vice president," <laughs> and that's how we picked our titles. Okay. But you know. Jared, was, uh, let me, let but me the decision is always by the triumvirate. Yes. Oh, yeah, we have to. And, and I think Dan is the bossiest, so he gets maybe the most power. But, you know, I'm, I'm bitchy, so if I don't like the decision, I'll kind of whine about it. And Seth kind of gets along and goes along. Jared, how do you, uh, how do you structure your days? That's my biggest difficulty post news. You see what happened? He quit. He quit his thing. Uh, Fox News. Fox, Fox News. News. And yeah, it, good. I'm glad it, he quit that place. <laughs> yeah, he quit. He quit. But then now he's complaining about how to structure. No, seriously. Your... Do you, you must, you have to be disciplined, right? I mean, do you structure? Listen, I, I grew up uh, a child of Joel Newberger, son of Ben <laughs> Newberger. All Newbergers wake up at five in the morning and they pace around the house. So my day is based on that behavior. I wake up at five in the morning. I read the newspapers. I make a few jokes on Twitter. Then by nine, I get to work. And then by five, I go for a walk. And that's new because I got diabetes during COVID. So oh, now man, I have to walk every day. Uh, but that's how I structure my day. And if a kid has a soccer or a tennis thing, I take them. If my wife has to do something, I fill in. I, it's just, I kind of go with the flow. But nine to five, you're on your computer doing like ironbound stuff. Like, is there yeah. enough work to do for on nine? My computer, but my job is kind of like waiting for people to call back or waiting for, you know, an animator to kind of draw something. So in the interim of my busy day with Ironbound, I'm browsing the news. I live a normal, you know, distracted American life yeah, where I could comment on the news of the day every once in a while during my lunch break. And we're getting into that in one second. But this brings me comfort because one of my biggest worries besides money every morning, and we just had this conversation yesterday, I don't think my wife is ever worried about money. And unlike your wife, my wife doesn't really work except with me. Um, so I digress for a moment. Oh, so I told... Carmela and Ileana, my wife, that there is not a day that goes by where I don't wake up anxious after having a bad night's sleep. So it's kind of comforting to hear that you're up pacing at 5 a.m. Are you worried about it's anything? Not, it's not nervous pacing. It's, okay. Uh, it's sort of the house is not big enough uh -huh. and I need to walk around. And you, it's like energy. 
<laughs> so I'm a, bowl, I'm a ball of energy and I've, I'm just like a pinball that's knocking around. Yeah. I'm making coffee. I drink the coffee. Then I say, hi, oh, I didn't have enough coffee. I go back up more coffee. <laughs> then I'm you know, watching a little bit of the news in the morning. I'm just kind of unsettled. Just kind of, you know, but don't you, don't you love the quiet time? Yes. I love the quiet time. It's great. It's great, but I'm, I'm not alone. It's like my, my family, when we go to like a, a hotel for a wedding and all the Newburgers get together, I come down from our room at five in the morning and I see my uncle and I see my other <laughs> uncle. <laughs> They're all sitting there, you know, like we're all looking at each other like, oh, you're like this too. So what I time think do you go to bed? What time do you go to bed? I, I go to bed kind of late, I guess, for, I, for a 5 a.m. wake up, 11. You really? Know? So you, yeah. only, you only get six hours a night. Yeah, on the weekends a little longer. Like I have a ton of crap to do, but my biggest worry every day is I don't have enough to do. And then I get so anxious, worried that I have nothing to do that, that I don't know. you don't do what you're supposed that, to. Yeah, but I always end up doing what I'm supposed to do. So yes, maybe I should is. just stop bitching about structure. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> By the way. He just made the resolution. You inspired him. Yes. But the difference between Joel and you is yeah. that he has. Jeremy's a, successful. No, say no, it, say no, it. no, 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 no. I didn't think of that. He was a Tribeca. I know. What else? <laughs> no, but the the difference is that you are a night person. I'm a total night owl. He's, uh, he's yeah. uh, like, you know, he has a big project and I say to him, no, how is it going? He says, I didn't start to work on it yeah. yet. It's six o'clock at night. At, at three o'clock, he texts me. I finished working at 3 a.m. Yeah, I, 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 my mind, it's a weird thing. And I, I've kind of told myself, we, maybe I need to to resolve to the, myself to the fact that I'll just be a, kind of working in the evenings. That's when my brain functions. It's weird. You know, when uh, when we were both at MSNBC, we had that kind of crossover time, right? Yeah. Uh, I was working a morning show. I was on the I Miss in the Morning yeah, show. Yeah, yep, yep. Oh, I remember yeah. that show. That was a very early wake up. I would go into Secaucus yeah. or Fort Lee, wherever we were at the time, at midnight and yeah. work an overnight shift. Yeah. And I did that for a good three or four years. And I met my wife during that time. I know how. And she sort of had to get used to this weird, you know, me up in the middle of the night because of it. Yeah. So some of my morning stuff is because of that four year period, I think too. I, I remember but that Joel well. forgets to tell you one more little detail in Joel's life. Yeah. He has three adorable Tiny children. Yeah, unlike you, Jeremy, oh, really? I, st I started well, super late. Hard. I have three that are seven and under, soon to be seven. Oh, but I all right. It's a good year. But I married young. <laughs> um, all right, just to put a bow on on uh, Morton Downey, who I love. So my buddy, one of my best friends, made a doc that you would love called Porn King about Al Goldstein. Oh, sure. I remember the, Al. Yeah, the famed <laughs> pornographer. So Al had a very kind of rough end. Let's just put it that way. His demise was not yeah. pleasant. He ended up homeless. But with Morton Downey, I read that in 1989, he was at the San Francisco airport and said he was attacked and had a swastika on his face. But then when police went to investigate, they realized that the swastika was inverse, meaning he probably drew it in a mirror for a tent. <laughs> yeah. That's how he went out basically, right? Yeah, he, he flamed out. His show was from 1988 to 1989, or sorry, 1987 to 1989, because he, he, he started to get too crazy and they couldn't rein him in. And then when he saw the ratings were shit, he went to the airport and pulled that stunt with the, the backward swastika. And then <laughs> you know where he went? Immediately after flying home from San Francisco, he went to Donald Trump's apartment <laughs> to strategize how to get out of trouble. Because <laughs> he knew he was fucked. <laughs> Even back then, Donnie Trump was figuring that out with people. Yeah. So Donald Trump was involved in the downfall of Morton Downey Jr. as he's involved in the downfall of everything. That's my uh, my two right. sons. On to the next topic, which is I find fascinating and gets back to structure. How many fucking hours a day do you tweet? And how did you get into this? Uh, I mean, I joined it like everyone stumbling onto a social media. I think my first tweet was in 2008. And I said I was having a pretzel. I really didn't know what, <laughs> you know, what the hell Twitter was or what I was supposed to say or do. I thought it was like Facebook where you just kind of react and say what you're thinking at the moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think I started becoming, uh, you know, a wannabe hashtagger, you know, by 2010, where I would see a hashtag, which is Carmel, you know what a hashtag yes, is? Yes, sir. Thank you for asking that question. I was just about to. Do you? Of course I know that it used to be like, uh, what was the name of that sign before? The ampersand. What? The A. The number sign. No, uh, no, the ampersand, the A. 
No, 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 no. This sign. Oh. One second. This one. Draw a quick this is the hashtag. Yeah, that's a hashtag. But what was it called before it was a hashtag? It was a number <laughs> sign, right? Number sign. They used to get phone numbers, right? In the 60s and the 70s. It'd be like Klondike number sign 5A. Oh, your Aunt Edda. Yeah. You know, it was, uh, it was an no. old uh, symbol. But I, I would just sort of find the hashtags that people were talking about and make jokes. I've always written jokes. Uh, since I was a kid, I've always been a, you know, wannabe joke writer. I did stand up comedy for a few years and I you was You said you didn't like doing it uh, yourself, but you liked writing for it. Yes. I didn't think that I was compelling to look at, but I had a good sense of humor. Oh yeah. You were wrong. You <laughs> That's actually. That's the best part of stand up comedy is not being compelling yeah. to look at. Yeah, well, I didn't have a good agent. <laughs> I'm going to get you back into it. <laughs> so, so then I decided, you know, to write jokes on Twitter. I think when Trump came down the escalator, I was uh, infuriated by the sort of xenophobia and the racism. And I had no outlet for it but to make jokes. And I decided that this is how I'm going to react to anything I found outrageous. I'm not going to be some, you know, overly uh, earnest, you know, scold. I'm going to try and find the satire. The humor, the satire. Now, Jeremy's got some serious... Wait a second. I had a fantasy today. Oh, yeah. Let's hear this. I had this fantasy. Yeah. What would have happened when when, uh, Trump and Melania stepped on the... on this escalator, somebody would have run very fast behind them and pushed them. <laughs> Jeremy, I'll let you answer that. I, I, I don't know. That, that's a great fantasy. I think I'm having that fantasy right now, too. I thought you were going to say someone pushed the button. and the, the <laughs> No, no, no. Like, push, just went like this a little, you know, and then they stopped. They probably would have had a soft landing on Melania's chest. That's probably my... <laughs> Ch- it would be, out, ch- listen, I can go further with this. It would be a hard landing because it's plastic. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right, right. Here. Listen, I had a very bad reaction to them. I mean, I, no offense to your years at Fox News, but I felt there was like a, a no subtle offense dog, taken. <laughs> a subtle dog whistle of, you know, racist stuff going on for the, the Roger Ailes years while I was at MSNBC and afterwards that really annoyed me. And I, w- I would often be satirical about Fox News. But Trump was sort of saying the, the racist stuff out loud. And that was really infuriating to me. And as the time kind of rolled on, uh, it wasn't so long before the, the, the march in Charlottesville happened where all of a sudden, you know, guys saying Jews will not replace us, you know, yeah. white supremacist assholes were marching down the street that I felt like w- we had reached some new milestone in, in the in the country where anti-Semitism was on the rise again and it was unchecked. And I felt like now this kind of hobby of joking around had more purpose. And all of a sudden I felt like I had to respond whenever things like that happened. And uh, I started getting retweeted by, you know, people of note, uh, meaning blue check marks, you know, verified celebrity. That's what I was going to get to. So ge- blue check, blue check mark means your I, as a Fox News correspondent, was once blue check marked. It means you're verified and that you're someone of importance. Oh. I'll have your blue check Well, mark, I have Jeremy. to you tell you, right. in, in, f- so, uh, for let- full disclosure, Joel got on Fox News, thanks to you will never believe whom. Who, that was the only person who helped Joel. We've discussed this before. No, Chris Cuomo. It's a long story that I've told oh, on the Chris podcast. Cuomo. Yeah, he helped me. He helped me get He's in. He's the only he person. Truly, News. nobody helped it's you. It's because he was stretching my wife at our local gym. That's how it all happened. Oh. Well, yeah, you are, are you really being nas- nasty. I told the story last time. I told the story last time. <laughs> you and, and my me. wife like Chris Cuomo. Uh, you know, yeah. Andrew Cuomo put aside, but my wife and I have watched Chris Cuomo for years. He's he's a great, great yeah. on TV, and he seems like a good. He, he reminds a- me. I grew up with Italian kids in my neighborhood when I was a kid. <laughs> Where did you grow up? Uh, Dix Hills and Deer Park were two neighboring towns in Long Island in the Huntington area. Oh, I so think I, a- I know this. I think I know that. No, he's he's a good he's a good guy, and I can honestly say he's the only guy that's ever helped me out of twenty three, except Steve Kappas. Um, oh. s- Steve, I love you. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, Steve, I didn't mean to. Yeah, I didn't mean, earlier. Everyone else, I hate. We love but, everybody. Everybody. But this is what I was getting to. So Jeremy's got like a who's who of followers: Ben Stiller. American Airlines, airline I hate to fly. Mira Sorvino, remember her? Yes. The, the actress. Yes. Dana Perino, rhymes Dana with Sorvino. Dana Perino. Follows him. Jim Acosta. 
Follow oh, us. Right. By the way, I have to tell you something. Rex Chapman and my favorite. Do you know who Josh Mankiewicz is? Why do I know him? He's a correspondent for Dateline. Oh, I'd like great. to. I need to get him on this podcast one day. But who, who, who am I missing? Who's like your favorite celebrity that follows you? Well, there's the people that follow me quietly that I can't believe they're following me. You know, like Ellen Barkin. Why is she following me? You know, yeah. or uh, Ellen who? Ellen uh, Barkin, an actress. Okay. And, oh, uh, I know Barkin. Rosie O'Donnell and Shara Silverman and Patton Oswalt. All yeah. like Shara Silverman. <laughs> That's awesome, man. That's like a badge of honor. Well, Richard, um, oh shit, uh, from Curb Your Enthusiasm, uh, hilarious. Rich- Marks? Is it Richard Marks? Not Richard Marks. Richard. Uh, he, uh, Lewis. Little Lewis. Richard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when yeah. I was a kid, when I was a kid, I was at the Jewish Y. They had a fair in you know, Coma, <laughs> yeah. and he was the comedian they had booked. <laughs> and I was walking around with a video camera because I was a nerdy kid. Yeah. And I went up to Richard Lewis and I said, "Mr. Lewis," and I forget what stupid question I asked him, but he was really nice. And I had it on tape, and I showed it to all my friends. I put it in the VCR. <laughs> Richard Lewis. Well, so and my dad used to take me to the Playboy Resort up in uh, the Catskills. I remember seeing Joan Rivers there yes. and oh, meeting fun. that chimp. I forget the chimp's name. There's <laughs> thin, yeah, something like that. So people remember Jeremy, funny we have to things. run in a minute because we're getting heavy, but I want to play a game with you real quick. Sure. I'm going to give you a broadcast celebrity and it's mm-hmm. word association. You can only just, you can only give me one word back. Sure. Laura Ingram. Oh. Uh, I started tough. I know. Ava Braun. Ava Braun. Up. Okay. I mean, mine, you know. would, mine would be see you next Tuesday. She's a horrendous human being. <laughs> you know, I met Laura Ingram. <laughs> she has uh, what see does it day. mean? What does it mean? <laughs> I, what? Spell out the words. See you next Tuesday. So I met I'll Laura Ingram. When I worked for IMAS, she was a frequent guest. Oh, yeah. And I went to Washington, D.C. to film Bernie uh, McGurk, who was the producer, yeah. also kind of troublemaker of, of uh, IMAS, almost yeah. like a you know, stuttering John. And she used to meet him, and they, they all were worried that the two of them were you know, an item. But I didn't think, you know, I didn't <laughs> think so. She was very nice. So now I see her on TV and she's saying terrible white supremacist shit. And I just don't understand what happened. It, it, it's like there was a turn. People went from being political commentators on the right to being white supremacists or white nationalists. I don't understand what shifted. Too many Botox injections. All right, we're going to move this along. Tucker Carlson, my old office corner mate. Fish sticks. Fish sticks. You know why he says that? No. Because uh, the family owns Swanson Frozen Foods. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Let's keep it uh, uh, fair and balanced here. Don Lemon. Oh, the um, Blizzard Mobile. <laughs> Blizzard. Why? And you hide, Don. Anderson Cooper. We'll get back to these. Yeah, what, Carm, this you're breaking like... up the rhythm of the game. Wait, wait, Don Lemon used to drive around, and if a cop a uh, car, they called the Blizzard Mobile in the storm. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Anderson Cooper. The mole. Yes, he used to host a show called The Mole. You know, I like Anderson Cooper. I think he's he's uh I remember seeing him in Haiti covered in like blood holding like a kid and I said, "Holy shit, this guy's like authentic. He's I, legit." I like Anderson, but after 30 years of doing what he's doing, it'd be nice if he could get a question out before three news cycles passed. <laughs> Another doc idea for you. Jesse Waters. Let me say one thing about this before I have you respond. I would love to get in an octagon with you, Jesse Waters, for 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 charity, yeah. I will kick yeah. your ass. What do you think of Jesse Waters? The one word, you know, uh, O'Reilly's intern, <laughs> Dana Perino, follower, <laughs> Nora O'Donnell, love it, love her, Nora O'Donnell. Wait, wait, she follows me, and I don't know why. I say <laughs> terrible things about Fox News, so I kind of like her for that. You've got to know your enemies. Um, do you know who Nora O'Donnell is? Yes. Okay. What do you think of her? I, irrelevant. <laughs> irrelevant. Good. Brian Williams. Truth wow. seek. <laughs> what did, hey, what you, did say? you say? Liar. Liar? Yeah. <laughs> Rachel Maddow. Uh, you know, not my cup of tea. <laughs> Andrea Mitchell. I, before I move on from the cup of tea, I'm politically aligned with her mostly, but I, it's, she's not my like go-to. That's not my kind of like news uh, show. Who is your go-to? Smirconish. Yeah, he's good. I love, yeah, I love Smirconish. I am a Smirconish. I'd follow that guy to uh, Guana if he went and started a cult. Uh, I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd go there. Well, he's, he's pretty he's fair funny. and balanced. Yeah, Jeremy yeah, is funny. 
for, I'm a moderate guy. I'm 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 a, a left leaning moderate. For uh, full disclosure, Carmelo said to me, "I don't know if I like this Newberger guy. He's a little too liberal." Carmelo used to be a total lib and is now switched yeah. in her older age. That's normal. I'm glad that you two hit you it know, off. it's normal to switch in your older age. You, uh, it's a long story. It's a long story. I am afraid of Black Lives Matter. Of right. um, of these new uh, right what there. what are they teaching uh, the uh, critical race theory in schools? Yeah, I am concerned about that. I'm sorry, it, and yeah, well, I I wonder what is happening to free speech. I think uh, I think that the the reaction to an over correction with exactly the pendulum swings too yeah. hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But mm-hmm. you know, at the same token. Uh, th- th- I, I don't know. I have to kind of know more about the curriculum uh, with critical race theory, because there are certain problems that I see uh, in terms of how I mean, you're watching GOP legislators around the country say that, you know, three fifths or uh, slavery wasn't bad. So it's like when you've got to combat that level of ignorance, you know, maybe there is some course correction or curriculum adjustment that needs to be made from our you know, now longstanding curriculum. But I hear you. I think I fall more in the middle because I know that one side is not always right. But at the moment, I feel like we're in uh, emergency response to a, a Nazi what happened problem. for the last for, last four years? Yeah, I mean, you survived the Holocaust. We should never, we should never have anyone close to a Nazi anywhere near this country. <laughs> we have people that are neo Nazis. But, out but the- darling, darling, uh, darling, anti Semites yes. are not only on the right; they are also on the left. They are. I, I agree. There's anti Semites on the left. I call them out on. I call balls and strikes to bring it back to baseball. I, uh, I know balls and strikes. I, I know that. If, if, if uh, Ilan Omar says, you know, uh, something positive about a Holocaust cartoon, she's going to hear it from me. But if Steve Scalise or Steve King are talking about the 14 words as if it's, you know, normal, they're going to hear from me. And I feel like one side is a little bit fakakta right now with, with white supremacy. So that's kind of where I feel. I, I'm trying to tip the balance back to normal. And, and, you've, got, and you've got a platform now, man. Use it wisely. Use it wisely. Yeah, and I have to be careful because I could say stuff that could cause trouble now. And I have to be careful. We are, we're all have to be responsible. You know, for- you Dude, know what? You know like what? When we start, I have to tell you, when we started this podcast, yeah. Joel and I were kibitzing the first session. We were just like sort of. Jared, this is cute. Carm doesn't want to let you go. She keeps talking. Keep going now. <laughs> No, you can no, no. no. What were you going to say? When we started now the- I completely forgot. No, you said when we first started this podcast. I don't remember anymore. Senior moment. No, a senior moment. You destroyed me. <laughs> Jeremy. <laughs> I made a film about Israel, so I feel like I have the uh, the credibility. Yes. To- no, uh, I, you know, the one of the first sessions, Joel said something to me, and I said, Carm, are you listening? I said, yeah. you know, I'm not listening because I am thinking whatever I say, and even if it's 15 people in the world to listen to this podcast, if one doesn't like it, they're going to come after me. Yes. The only the only good news is that I will be dead by the time they get to me, you know. Uh, but but I agree with you because there are a lot of crazy people out there and freedom. I am pro freedom of speech. Yes, I believe it. I believe it. I, I'm pro-speech. like, for example, on the way here, Joel told me that uh, that uh, uh, Facebook decided to, to keep their ban on Trump, to keep their ban on Trump. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, Joel says it's a private company. Right. Twitter, um, uh, Google and uh, Facebook, they have absolute monopolies. They yeah. they run the country, really. They mm. do. And if they if they decide who who can speak and who cannot, it's yeah. it's already. I grew up in. Well, the great in, thing about capitalism I is grew Trump up is in socialist Yugoslavia. You know, socialist Yugoslavia yeah. from yeah. from forty five until I finished high school fifty eight. Yeah. I was living in a communist country, and 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 wasn't bad. <laughs> it really wasn't bad. I tell you, but it was a communist country with Tito. What? But there was no freedom of speech. Right. And there's no freedom to go on forever. And you know, when when we had elections, there was one candidate. There you go. That's not so bad. And and I think, very honestly, I think for a long time in this country, it will be a one party system. Hmm. 
It's possible. I'll tell you this though. If freedom of speech involves screaming fire in a theater, then that's not freedom of speech anymore. That's no, incitement. No, that is 100% not. I think Donald Trump incited something, and that's probably why they're having trouble of whether or not letting him talk. But I agree with you about freedom of speech. I just think we have to be careful about what's said. No, definitely, definitely. Carm, I'm going to give you Jeremy's number. Uh, Jeremy, <laughs> this was awesome. I feel we have a lot to talk we, about. What, what's the Twitter handle? Uh, Not that it's hard to find, but what's the Twitter handle? At Jeremy Newberger? Uh, Jeremy Newberger. Uh, Newberger is not spelled like the hamburger. It's N-E-W-B-E-R-G-E-R. -E -E you see, this is where my spelling, not knowing how to yes. spell, comes into. Because I knew it. It's new, like old, burger. And his documentary, Young Punks, is coming out. All misspelled. <laughs> I can't tell you where it's found a home, and this summer we'll be making an announcement. Oh, awesome. It's going to be out this summer, or you're making yeah. the announcement? Oh, nice. Awesome. Well, listen, Jared, it was awesome catching up, and uh, we appreciate you having having you on here. Yeah, you, I really appreciate your time, oh, and well, I wish pleasure. you a lot of success. You are a young man. Everything <laughs> is relative. You are less than half my age, a little oh. more than half my age. You have a lot of so Someone who's halfway past me. <laughs> what? What? What's, is, his, what's your advice for someone who's halfway past him? Uh, to enjoy it, enjoy it. They're young. Don't worry advice. about. Don't worry about structure. <laughs> Jared, it was awesome. I'm gonna hang up on you now, and I'll be in touch with you uh, offline. Awesome. Good All talking right, with you guys. Okay. Thank you. Survive. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Bye. We'll be back with. The new schmooze. I forgot to toss. Welcome back. It's time for the news schmooze. So what do you think of Jeremy? No, he's a bright guy. Very smart guy. You thought you wouldn't like him, but you he's loved him. Very, I, I thought I wouldn't. I thought he would be like much more. Like left. he's oh, no he no I don't say left I don't say right open open he's a very bright funny guy warm warm nice guy warm nice funny giving it is time now for the new schmooze and we went very heavy with Jeremy so we're gonna fly through this Carm story number one Iran just released horrifying fake footage of the U S Capitol being blown up as President Biden now comes under increasing pressure to take action. The video was leaked on state-controlled Iranian TV, much to the pleasure of the Supreme Leader Al Ali al-Khamenei. Um, what I found, first of all, what's your reaction to hearing this, that they're showing the Capitol being blown up? Makes me think of that, uh, the designed, uh, designated survivor. They probably got the idea from one of those television it programs. It makes me think, why do we need Iran? We almost did it on our own. It's a very good point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on to the next story. Or, or stolen from a from a TV series. E yes, former President Trump, as we discussed on the way in here today to date the show, uh, has been uh, the ban on Facebook has been extended. So he announced yesterday, almost. Uh, what's the word? Um, I was going to say um, I have a head cold, so I can't think today. Oh, Concurrently, he I has don't know. his period. Yeah. Well, <laughs> That's just a glimpse into my life. Trump announced that he's going to uh, have his own communications platform as a place to, quote unquote, speak freely and safely. He's eventually going to have the ability to communi communicate directly with his followers after months of being banned from sites like Twitter and Facebook. Any guess what the name of the platform is? Freedom. Let me ask you this. Do you think it has Donald Trump's name in it? Oh, yes, in, in gold letters. From the desk of Donald J. Trump. Okay. There you go, on brand. Next story, Bill Gates. You've heard of him, correct? Oi, he's oi, only oi, 65. Oi, 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 oi. Announced he's getting divorced. The couple, this is interesting, him and, by the way, I told Belinda Gates, if you're watching this, which I know you are, that I would marry you and I have my wife's permission to do so. It has nothing <laughs> to do with money. I have followed you for years on Twitter, and I think you have an amazing personality. <laughs> um, 100% nothing to do with part money. Part of this prenup they have is Bill could, 
could vacation for a long weekend at the beach every year with his venture capitalist ex-girlfriend who's five years older, Ann Winblad, 70. What do you think of that? That's a little weird, right? What, what do you think's going on here? You were a marriage therapist. This blows my every one of my theories lately. I just should really retire. Now, what do you because think's going I on? said to Roy, my husband, at mm. lunch today, I said to him, you know, what's your theory? Why are they splitting up? And he said to me, one or the other has somebody else. And I said, Bill Gates is almost on the spectrum, almost, I'm being diplomatic. And I said, it's probably uh, his wife, Linda, that, that maybe— Belinda. Belinda. He's almost on the spectrum of being a trillionaire is what he's on the spectrum of. It doesn't matter. I didn't think he would have a girlfriend, but then men don't know what to do with, with their We never sexuality. thought that Sandy Milgram would have a girlfriend either. Exactly. That's my dermatologist from seventh grade. Um, Carm, He had I, a nurse who was like a head taller. They literally had to use a ladder to get up there. I spared you the story about the guy that abused his dog and then barbecued it. And for that, that guy, I hope, fucking gets a death penalty and dies a miserable, slow death. You piece of all right Joel don't we'll be get, right back don't work with three questions for with... grandma to wrap up the show it's time now for three questions for grandma and we are back for three questions for grandma Carmela was going through her purse. What were you looking for? You you cannot sit still I can now. tell you it's confidential. Okay. Joel look Oh, we have to pay the podcast studio. Um, Carmela, three questions for grandma. What, courtesy of my three children, what makes white, white? <laughs> I know there is the color spectrum. I had trouble with this too. Wait a second, color Like sp- blue is like white and no, yellow or one something. one second, one second. I think, I think it, it's like the, 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 the non-color color. The white can, and black. Can a boy be a girl and a girl a boy? I feel like of that's a song Of course lyric. they can, honey. <laughs> How do I explain that one to them? What? How do I explain that one to them? Th- that I would say it's extremely ra- rare and very, 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 very rare that these things happen and uh, like, like you know, it almost never happens. And when it happens, uh, then the person is born with the characteristics of both. Last question for grandma. And if they weren't born with that, then they know that they're a girl or a boy. Last question. Why does grandma always use curse words when she speaks to you? I told you this long time ago, and I'm <laughs> returning to that because I love you. Carm, it's always bittersweet when we come to the end. We've accomplished a lot. We've finished another episode, but now I go structureless till next Wednesday. Any words of advice? Talking to Jeremy made me feel better. I have to say— Jeremy's subtext was I basically do nothing from 9 to 5 except tweet and answer some calls. Basically, Joel, what was your question? I said that we have no structure— once again, till next Wednesday, any advice? I am not giving any more advice, and I'm considering talking to an attorney to disown you, actually. <laughs> I've had it with you, whiny little. Love you, too. And you know what? Love you, America. Peace out. I'm doing the Geraldo. Love you, America. Love you, America.